I'd like to start with a slide congratulating machine learning AI and computer vision for their great success because they really outperformed all other fields of science recently, it seems, as you can see over here. Um, this is uh, data from Google Scholar. <laughs> and if you look into the top five lists of AI, uh, of course, you know all the names, so I'm not going to mention them over here, but you can see the overall citations in the HDBCs. It's just an indication, but in any case, 100,000 citations per year. You know, this is something quite astounding. And um, this great success also comes with great responsibility. That's what I'd like to stress. Now, we have an interesting debate recently, namely one of those scholars over here, actually the leading one, um, Geoffrey Hinton has left Google and he's spoken up that he thinks AI might constitute a great threat to humanity. He's not the first one, but this has really created a sensation because all the newspaper has reported about it. There were many others before, you know, including Elon Musk and so on. Um, and of course, there are different opinions on this. And there's uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber, one of the most famous AI people in Switzerland. And he sees humanity is just a transition state, basically there to create something even bigger, namely AI and robots. You know, will basically colonize space with robots. And humans may be gone someday. So who is right? Geoffrey Hinton or Jürgen Schmidhuber with this wonderful apocalyptic phone number over here, as you can see. I'll come back to this. Today, I'd like to talk about traffic light control, an old problem, in fact. And someday, when I still was at TU Dresden, we decided to reinvent it from scratch. Why? Because despite decades of traffic light control, there were a lot of traffic jams all over cities around the world. So it didn't work. Moreover, we wanted to have something that can handle complex street networks, that can handle traffic disruptions, such as building signs and accidents, and was also suitable for particular events, such as Olympic games, pop concerts, and so on and so on. And as it happens, Jürgen Schmidhuber also got interested for a second in this subject. So a newspaper reported uh, AI would basically defeat um, traffic jams and Lugano uh, would become a living laboratory and Jürgen Schmidhuber would slash down on congestion. It would be gone. And then nobody ever heard about it again, I believe. At least I did not find those publications that basically show that he actually fixed it. Now I got inspired by a visit, and then we should do more holidays because there was a visit to Egypt, not known generally as one of the most technologically advanced countries at the moment, but I found that really astonishing because there was an intersection which did not have any traffic lights, no policemen, and it worked perfectly, just next to the pyramid of Giza. Why is this the case, you know? Highly diverse traffic, you know, cars, buses, camels, horses, everything you can imagine, it works. And it works because of the design. We have unidirectional flow in the front, opposite unidirectional flow in the back, and a buffer in the middle that allows everyone to adjust the speed in such a way that you could cross the stream of traffic flow when a gap opens up. And we saw, okay, this is the solution. We need to learn how this really works. And now we basically translate that into software, an algorithm that would do it for us. 
in any other place of the world. And furthermore, we were inspired by another subject that we've been working on for some time, which is pedestrian flows, particularly self-organization of pedestrians, such as over here at the bottleneck where we can see oscillatory flows. And it looks like there would be a traffic light controlling this, but actually it's not. This is self-organization. On one side, pressure builds up, then basically the pedestrians force their way, and then eventually the flow direction turns because of that pressure built up and relief. And we saw aren't intersections basically also bottlenecks just for more different flow directions. And couldn't we use that self-organization principle, that pressure-based one, in order to define traffic lights? So couldn't we have traffic flow control the traffic lights rather than the other way around? Couldn't we turn traffic dictatorship as we have it around the world where a traffic control center tries to tell everyone what to do into democracy where people decide what happens and how well would that work? Now, this is the overall principle. We would have measurement sensors that measure not only the outflow from a section of the road, but also the inflow. And that inflow allows basically make a very short term prediction, but that is enough to allow for some adaptability. And as you can see on the right, green waves will result. Even though there's no overall control, it's just a coordination that makes that happen throughout the entire city, in fact. Now, of course, you could say, oh, that's just a square lattice, you know, it's a particular simple case. So we'll have to look into how well that really works. And here's some publications about it, you know, it goes back to the year 2008 or so. And I'd like to compare now three different ways of traffic light control. On the left, there is what we do today, basically. In most places, we have a traffic control center. And that tries to be enlightened by all that information that comes from the entire city. So once you have that data, you try to come up with the best control ever. Like a band of dictator, you would implement it throughout the city, if you have enough money to have all those sensors and so on, right? There is another approach in the middle, which does not include coordination explicitly throughout the city. But instead, those cars in the neighboring intersections would determine the traffic lines at that intersection. So each intersection would separately try to take the optimal decisions to minimize trouble time. We could call that a homo economicus approach. Everyone is trying to do the best locally, but doesn't care about others. We would think, okay, that would not uh, create coordination, so the traffic control center should definitely be better. And then on the right, you see a third approach where we do the same thing as in the middle, but if we have long queues, then we would first basically clear those queues before we go back to travel time minimization. So that other regarding behavior with regard to the neighboring intersections kind of seems to reduce performance, and therefore we would expect that this is going to be the worst solution. But let's look into this, you know, um, because in complex systems, things can sometimes be counterintuitive. And what we see over here is the Q lanes as a function of the capacity of utilization. I mean, how much traffic is there approaching intersections? You can see that the Top-down regulation by a traffic control center creates a linearly increasing curve, more or less, and that is somehow what we expect. Looks all right, but what happens for the selfish optimization and the homo economicus approach? Now here it turns out is much better at low traffic volumes because every approaching vehicle gets a green light right away. It doesn't have to wait until the period is over. However, eventually there's a capacity where Q length explodes and doesn't work anymore. So 
we would say is traffic control centers have a purpose, right? And that's why we spent millions on them in every single city. And we could say, okay, Adam Smith's invisible hand, we stop and say it works over here, but over there it fails. And then the interesting question, what happens if we with the search approach? And here it turns out it's better all the way, surprisingly. It combines two principles which both are verse. How can that be better? Complex systems. So basically it suggested that we can make the invisible hand work with the right kind of information feedback. And then the question was, now how well does that work? And at that time, as I said, uh, I was still in Dresden with um, um, Stefan Lemmer, and Stefan Lemmer actually is also working for Lumicera. So he did a PhD with me, and uh, then we were interested to see how well it works. So we talked to the traffic authority over there and they said, we are happy with our system. We just bought a new one, state of the art. Just there is a little problem over here in the center, you know, where we have um, wind waves, which are even adaptable, but we'd like to prioritize public transport. And we see this does not look square road like anymore, so it's very complex. And on top of all this, there are many trams and buses that cross in different ways through that area. And if you would prioritize any of those buses or trams, basically you would interrupt the green waves and that would produce congestion. And that congestion would grow to be a monster traffic jam within minutes. And then you have that for hours. So they could not prioritize public transport. And so we did a simulation based on the same data that was used to calibrate their state of the art control which obviously produces green waves, as you can see over here. And that is what our self-control approach actually produced. Also green waves, but not so impressive ones. Now more variable, but it turns out to be more adaptive. Because as it turns out, public transport benefits a lot from that self-control approach, but not at the cost of all the other participants. So motorized traffic benefits as well, pedestrian cyclists largely, and the environment too. And that was kind of unexpected. Now the question is, uh, would machine learning be any better? That was before, you know, most people did machine learning. Now everyone does machine learning first. <laughs> and, and so, I have now another PhD student, Marcin Koretsky, and uh, he has been comparing different kinds of traffic light control because of the corona lockdowns. He got a little bit bored, it seems, and he implemented all those uh, different approaches. And now we know that, of course, um, machine learning can do better than a lot of other approaches, but the analytic class, which is kind of the same, the uh, same thing that as the self-control approach that I described to you before, this is doing pretty well. And in fact, it turns out that this does not even have to learn. So in order for machine learning to get as good as the analytic approach, it takes a long time. You need many iterations for the system to learn that. Now for the sake of happiness and peace, uh, here is the good news. If you combine the analytic approach with machine learning, that's going to create a hybrid approach and that is best. So machine learning has a benefit. That's what you believed anyway, but <laughs> the point is you cannot do it without the analytic approach. Now things get even more interesting once you have disrupted systems. And unfortunately, a lot of systems throughout the world are suffering from disruptions. In this case, it could be accidents, could be building sites. So every day, the situation can change. So 
it's not useful to have the best traffic light control ever if the situation for which you optimize the system never occurs. And that is actually the problem of the centralized traffic light control. You know, traffic light control is an MP hard problem. Basically, there are so many parameter combinations and possible solutions, and you cannot just extrapolate between one solution and another and because of the complexity. So there's large variability as you change parameters just a little. And so basically you cannot really explore the entire solution space and need to make simplifications. You throw away a lot of good solutions. And you basically create the best solution offline for a typical situation like Monday morning between nine and 10. Now, but then the traffic situation is never typical. There's always a deviation. And then you make it adaptive, but you don't change everything, like the order of traffic lights. So you're throwing away a lot of good solutions, in fact, some of the best. And this is state of the art. You know, that's what you pay millions for. So now it turns out if we compare machine learning and the analytic self-control approach for that disrupted scenario, then actually the machine learning doesn't look so good. Because before it has adapted, learned the new situation, the situation has changed. Now here's a little quote from our esteemed rector. Now we have a, a incredible hammer in our hand, and the question is, what are the right nails uh, to to hit? Right, because typically, one when one every time one has a new hammer, everything becomes a nail. And he was talking about AI, ChatGPT in particular, but not only. And so the point is, AI is a wonderful tool. It can be applied to a lot of things. It's cool, you know. It performs well, but does it perform well enough? Does it perform better than anything else? Why is this important? Because people now often say we have problems so big, people don't understand them anymore. They can only be solved by AI. So basically all the difficult problems, they just give it to AI. And one of those difficult problems is lack of sustainability of this planet. This is a matter of life and death, actually. People don't often talk about it, but that is a fact. And for that reason, the United Nations has come up with those 17 goals. Actually, there's more than a 170 targets. And there's also a paper that uh, looks into this and basically um, suggests that AI has overall a lot more positive impacts in terms of addressing those challenges then negative impacts. And so let's just do it. You know, that would be the message that most people would get. But again, would it be good enough to save the people on this planet? And one of these approaches that are now very fashionable is digital twins. Works probably still quite well for certain things in cities, so like infrastructures that don't change. More troublesome as, long, as soon as you have complex dynamics involved. And that comes about also because there are people who do all sorts of things. And they are now also trying to create digital twins of people, their thinking, their health and everything. I would also be used basically to improve systems, control systems. And uh, of course, the military is using that as well. And here, the sentient world simulation is just one of those approaches being used, unfortunately, not just for peace, but also for psyops and wars and so on. And the question is could the military save the world with a war room approach? So if we had powerful, powerful, powerful AI with huge amounts of data, could the military basically fix it? And they've been concerned, not only about democracy. Today, I'd like to highlight my concern. If we would 
use AI to run the world in a data-driven way, which may be an option, you know, there's, there's the satellites, there's the data, there are the Internet of Things sensors, there's the AI systems, there's quantum computing, there's, you know, it seems like that's one option, but should we do it? And based on the improvement of the approach that I've presented to you today about self-control of traffic flow, which creates something of the order of 15 to 20% higher performance, it would be an equivalent of one billion people more or less on this planet that could survive. And that's why this is a very important question. In fact, the world, it seems, has not improved recently. We're at the brink of a polycrisis, perhaps even at the brink of collapse. And what I think is very much important, but not yet paid enough attention to, is digital twins and all the technologies used to run complex systems often lack complexity science. In fact, we cannot control everything top down. That's the conclusion that we drew from the projects that we've been working on. Turn out that chaotic traffic light control could be better for traffic participants and the environment. And in the meantime, there are also implementations in Switzerland, which you will hear about right in two minutes from now, one of those cities that has engaged into this new self-control approach is Lucerne. So back in 2019, we said, uh, we're checking out this super traffic light. I don't know who came up with that word, or sounds nice, of course. And I was independently evaluated by an institute of ETH search. Um, I did not even know about it. It was also not involved personally. And, they confirmed that this is really working incredibly well, unbelievably well, in fact, because there was more green for everyone, it seemed, which means nothing else than there was not a waste of green time anymore. So everyone benefited and the environment too, and uh, this is exceptional now in Switzerland and also this is interesting for other countries too. And I'm handing over with this to Christian Heimgartner, who will give you some further insights into some of the work they've done in the few minutes that we have over here today. Thank right you very much. What would then be the right strategy to push for the right use of uh, AI in communication, regardless of the field, and also making people, especially policy makers, aware of this perhaps overuse or misuse in certain in certain domains? Do you have any, any insights or personal opinions? I, I think AI currently is so successful that people don't see anything else anymore. You know, that, that is the issue. And I think this is dangerous because, you know, if it doesn't work, AI people will be blamed. In fact, the President Biden just called in all those AI bosses, you know, to talk to them, and apparently they were not so amused. So um, that's the issue. It's... Um, we are living in a time of attention economy. Also, that principle is being used to boost certain types and technologies. And yeah, we, we need to face a situation where perhaps we're approaching times which is getting ever closer to the matrix, where those things which are not being that we don't see any more those things that are not promoted by those digital systems. Mm -hmm. I think that that is dangerous and that's why I think we should uh, 
spend more time reflecting on the ethical issues and also the complexity related issues and um, find ways to give a, a more integrated and more balanced advice to policymakers. <laughs>